to have an automated lesson ready for next week because I won't be here. I'll be on vacation, but it didn't work, so no class next week. You're, you're kind of getting used to being here and not being here, so we'll sort of We're jump back and forth. We will be here uh, today, and on the 19th and the 26th, we'll do, the next next time we meet, we're going to have some fun. Uh, what's called Fun with Meter. I won't oh. say more about it until we get together. Okay. We'll do a little contemporary music. We will not meet the second, because this whole place will be torn up and ready for Bible school to start the next day. We'll finish off in on the 9th. So, uh, last time we were together, Martin Luther was doing battle with John Calvin about different approaches to music in the church. And um, Calvin and some of those who continue to follow his, his um, teachings and tradition insisted that since the Bible has no pipe organs or pianos in it, you don't use those in church. You might be able to use timbrel, whatever that is, like a tambourine, yeah. or a lyre if you happen to have one of those laying around, <laughs> or a harp, bell, uh, yeah, bells maybe, trumpet you could use, which is probably a lamb's horn, which is tough to tune those things. <laughs> and the only songs really that they saw were in the Bible were the Psalms. Well, that's all they sang, and without any, usually without any accompaniment. And so, um, not that he phrased it this way, but if you insist on Calvin's style of approach to music in the church, then there are some subjects that you'll never sing about. Namely, oh, everything in the New Testament. <laughs> Jesus, for one, you know. Uh, so, yeah, right. Luther had a whole different approach to things. And uh, opened the door to um, letting the hymnody that was written begin to express the theology of the church and the New Testament side of the equation as well. So, uh, yeah, we have to thank, oh no, I'm sorry. That's Charlie Watts. He's the drummer for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> I meant Isaac Watts and Charlie Wesley, or Charles Wesley. That's my attempt at a joke. So, <laughs> <laughs> so these two guys, uh, really for us, at least as English hymn singers, uh, helped turn the corner into new territory. Uh, Isaac Watts was responsible for one of the. Oops, we're not there yet. Hold on, hold on. For um, taking one of the first New Testament texts and setting it to music for our congregational sin. And um, it was called. By the way, I don't know if I did. We have his dates up there. No. Uh, hi. Uh, Isaac Watts was 1674 to 1748, so he was even before the Revolutionary War. This is in early America. He was imported from England, and um, it, back in England, there was, of course, the Church of England. That was the state church. But there were dissenter groups in England who said, I don't want to be under the authority of the state church, the ritual, the whatever, and probably had some of the same arguments that later, Luth well, maybe not later, that Lutherans had too. In lots of Scandinavian countries, the Lutheran church was the state church. And in some cases, it was very liturgical, very formal, very clergy-led. And there were some people who loved that. And there were some people who said, you know, I find that confining. I don't feel free enough. So there were other movements within the Lutheran tradition called pietism and others. And similar things were happening in England over against the state church of England. So Isaac Watts's father was one, an elder in one of those dissenter congregations. And uh, so his father invited him to see what he could do about it. And that's where we get the first of Isaac Watts's first, the first of his hymns called, Behold the Glories of the Lamb. If you know this one, you can sing along, but I have a YouTube video of a group singing, Behold the Glories of the Lamb. <laughs> Things rolling. 
And um, picking up with, uh, on his, oh, by the way, let's step for a moment. Take your red book out and flip way to the back to page 
he did a good job of introducing us to um, good, good hymns, good theology. And he wrote in his journal for May 21st, 1738. This is, this is again before the Revolutionary War, even before what we've just been celebrating this weekend. At nine, I began a, a hymn upon my conversion, but I was, and I don't know if that's at nine years old or at nine o'clock at night. <laughs> But I was persuaded to break off for fear of pride. Mr. Bray, coming, encouraged me to proceed in spite of Satan. I prayed to Christ to stand by me, and I finished the hymn. Upon afterwards showing it to Mr. Bray, the devil threw a fiery dart, suggesting that it was wrong, and I had displeased God. My heart sunk within me when, casting my eye upon a prayer book, I met with an answer for him. Why boastest thou thyself, thou tyrant, that thou canst do mischief? Upon this, I clearly discerned it was a device of the enemy to keep back glory from God. The next day, his brother John Wesley was converted, and Charles wrote in his journal, Toward ten, my brother was brought in triumph by a troop of our friends and declared, I believe. We sang the hymn with great joy and parted with prayer. It's why we thought that this hymn was the one that brought his brother around. So, um, this is... If you look up in American religious history, there are great awakenings. And the first great awakening would be more, it would be even earlier in, in early colonial times. But this is the time of what was what's called the second great awakening. Um, and in that letter that or that journal entry, uh, oh no, no, in the hymn, a brand plucked from eternal fire. As I sang that this morning, I was remembering a sermon I read by Jonathan Edwards another one of those preachers from that day, whose most famous sermon is titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He was the picture, he's the poster boy of fire and brimstone preachers. And in his sermon, he asked you to consider yourself as a little spider on the end of a thread of spider web hanging over the, the fires of hell, and God's got a hold of the other end of the string. And you deserve to be let go. Never forget that. So when you talk about the, when, G, when Martin Luther teaches us in the Catechism, we are to fear and love God above everything else, that is part of the element of remembering God is God and you're not. And if God were to treat us, if only you were smarter, if only you were better at what you're supposed to do, if only you were kinder, if only, if only, if only, all out the morning sermon, he'd let us go. But he didn't. He doesn't. So this period of time is filled with a lot of uh, a lot of preachers, a lot of evangelists, a lot of this is probably where the tent meetings get started, even back that far back. Um, and it led to a new kind moving on into the uh, this 18th and 19th centuries, a, a new kind of music called gospel. Now I like to think that most of the hymns in this book are gospel, but um, that, you know, among musicologists, I guess you'd say, this new style has a, that title about it. And there's some distinctions that they make. And so a few of the heroes of this um, movement are Fanny Crosby, who uh, unfortunately was uh, mistreated when she was young. And um, she's written a couple of songs in our book, number 335. Oh yeah, Jesus keep me near the cross. You can see down on the left side of the very bottom, there's the text, Fanny Crosby, and the guy who wrote the music for it. But the other one, that's I think a little more familiar, 638. That would be it. Oops, we're supposed to start now. <laughs> And assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. So she writes,
writes, or someone writes, during the recent war in the Transvaal, I think that's South Africa, a gentleman at my prayer meeting in Exeter Hall said, when the soldiers going to the front were passing another body of soldiers whom they recognized, their greetings used to be, 494 boys, 494, and the salute would invariably be answered with, six further on boys, six further on. The significance of this was that in sacred songs and solos, a number of copies of which had been sent to the front, the number 494 was, God be with you till we meet again. And six further on than 494, or number 500 was, blessed assurance. <laughs> so they had their own code that they used to communicate the text of different psalms. Another one of these pioneers, you might say, is uh, Lena Sandell, or in our hymnal, she's known as Carolina Sandell Berg. And she's written four hymns that are in our book. Close to the one we're at is 683. And that is... The Numberless Gifts of God's Mercy. I don't think we've ever sung that one. But you probably recognize number 790. Bench was where you they sat you 
to try and work on your emotions until you finally gave it up and said, Jesus, take me, you know, I accept you as my Savior, that kind of thing. That kind of very highly emotional, powerful type thing, which is what those tent meetings were all about. And, and even, um, well, as recently as oh, 15 or 20 years ago when I first met Dan Nelson, who's the pastor at First Baptist over on Temple, he and some others of that tradition who had a, a tradition of Sunday services and Sunday night services, for example. They said the Sunday morning service is the evangelistic service. The Sunday night service is where they feed the members, which I thought was an interesting concept. They, they had Sunday school preaching, training in and preaching again at Okay. But the emphasis was, like in these tent meetings, to bring you to faith and do it on a very highly emotionally charged. And that's where these hymns left the territory of the earlier stuff and incorporated a much more personal approach. And this tradition carries on into contemporary Christian music, a lot of which has a very personal, individualistic flavor to it, which is, I'm not a musicologist, but I would, I'm going to guess that more so in America, and maybe in England, than anywhere else in the world, do you find a hymn tradition that emphasizes the me and Jesus more than the we and Jesus? And you maybe have heard me do this speech before, but it bears repeating. In English, the, is the only language where you can look at the word you and the word you, and it's the same. No other language. Every other language differentiates between the singular and the plural. So there's no other language where you can confuse when Jesus is talking to everybody or just talking to one. It's clear in the text. It's not clear for us. And in a culture that glorifies the individual, when I can read a you that was originally meant for everybody and think of it as just addressed to me, I, I latch onto that in this culture of ours, which loves to glorify, well, I can make something of myself if I work hard, and Jesus is behind me in this because he's talking to me in the text, right? Not so much. <laughs> and uh, the classic example I've quoted a thousand times, people come into my office saying, Pastor, God forgot the promise that was made in Corinthians where God said, I will not let you be tested beyond your ability, but I will provide you a way out. And they say, God didn't keep that promise. I don't, I don't see a way out. I said, you know what? He didn't make you that promise. He made the community that promise. That's a plural. So my question back is, are you connected to anybody in the body of Christ? Then God will keep that promise. But if you're thinking you're going to live this life on your own, you ain't got a chance. You can't make it on your own. God, Jesus said, apart from the vine, you're dying, and you're going to go in the fire. It's that simple. Well, in America, we, and, 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 and our Lutheran book has got plenty of me and Jesus hymns, because it, a lot of our hymnody comes out of that period of time. But a lot of the newer stuff has brought a balance back. So there's a lot more we songs in the red book than there used to be in the older red and green books. And contemporary Christian hymnody, uh, Christian songs, not hymnody, Christian songs like the Second Service has struggles with that because a lot of them that are heard on the radio are coming out of more of this other tradition. And so there's a lot more me, me and Jesus songs. And I've struggled with every band leader we have on that topic to keep it balanced. We'll talk about that more in a couple weeks. So give me that old time religion, all right? So now it's time for a quiz. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even like him when I was in school. <laughs> well, well, this won't be graded or anything like that. Is this is open book. This is open book. Yeah. Yes, it is, actually. Actually, it is open. All right, Barbara, you don't have to chime in on this one. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. One of the most popular 20th century hymns was written in 1907 by Henry Van Dyke to the melody of which piece of classical music? Mm -hmm. oh. No, don't ask Barbara. Oh. It was... Uh, I know, I know. It, it wasn't Mozart. Mozart. Oh, no, it wasn't Mozart. It was Beethoven. Yes, it was Beethoven. Yes, Beethoven. 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 Beetho
question for me? Oh, okay. Oh, I was just thinking that what, one time you were searching, it was listed there, and it didn't say Beethoven wrote it. I thought that was strange. I don't know what. You know what it was Yeah, at least he gets the credit in the hymnal. I don't know what. You're talking about the worship folder, maybe? Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the worship folder. Yeah, well, we don't ever, I've never put the author of the text or the tune in the worship folder. Oh, okay. You have to look the book for Oh, that's okay. All right. Well, then, yeah, we got to do something for you. Too. I can't do everything for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Especially music or something. All right. Oh, maybe it's not that piece that we just heard. Maybe it's the choir sings. Yeah. Yeah. That's set to yeah. Moonlight Sonata, maybe? Mm -hmm. Is it the Moonlight Sonata? There is one. I think it's the Moonlight Sonata. I think. Um, yeah, what well, is that, too? Yeah, so maybe they didn't match. Maybe that was okay. Yeah. Okay. Next something. question. Brian Wren, one of the most prolific and prominent contemporary hymn writers. The hymn Christ is Alive that Christian Singh was written for Easter 1968. This is a, this is a tough question. Everybody gets this one. That's pretty cool. In response to which of these tragedies? So if you want to open it, if you want to open it 389. We'll sing a little bit. The sheet music's going to be on the screen, but it's a little hard to read.
Dragon School, I think it's in, in England. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, the British. Yeah. So, we're going to be at a children's party and like that. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Okay, another question. This uh, 20th century saw much greater awareness of hymns from around the world. Which of these hymns was written in Swedish, translated through three further languages before being popularized by the work of Billy Graham in the 50s and 60s? Here I have a little. Now we got conflict, yeah. conflict in the house. Resolve it. Mm, I think we have two verses for how great thou art. Three words. Fifth how great thou art. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Here's a little story behind the hymn. Originally written in 1885 by Carl Boberg, whose name I think probably appears at the bottom of the 856. I didn't know he was Swedish. I think the writer was Swedish. The writer was Swedish. Oh, 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 okay. I know Bill. I know Bill. I knew he was a sea captain, but I didn't know he was Swedish, is what I'm trying to say. So Boberg wrote the hymn, wrote the poem. <laughs> He was a poet, lay minister, and member of the Swedish parliament. Well, the uh, English words are rather circuitous. They originate with a missionary called Stuart Hine, who, while serving in Poland, heard a version of the hymn which had been translated into German and then into Russian, and he produced the English translation and adapted the Swedish melody. And the full version of the modern hymn was published in 53 and sung by George Beverly Shea during Billy Graham's 1954 crusade in London and extensively in the years past. So that's a little backstory on that one. He had a nice voice. Yeah, I did. Now we're going to conclude with, um, this brings us up pretty close to modern times. This hymn is from 2001. And... Um, According to the, the website author here, this one has made a uh, pretty big impact by Keith Getty, words by Stuart Townsend, uh, part of a new hymnal, new Irish hymns project. Um, I think I made a better job of the scrolling text this time, because <laughs> I wanted you to be able to sing along after you caught the melody. We'll let this one roll through, and it's a little slower. <laughs> Wow. 